Hey everybody, welcome back to our weekly business development webinar. I'm Bob Veering. Uh, I'm excited about today's presenter because he can help with the one thing that almost everyone needs, getting and keeping customers. Kirk King is the president of Continuity Programs. His company provides, among other things, an automated marketing system for contractors that makes it easy to generate leads, referrals, testimonials. I haven't met Kirk in person, but I've been hearing good things about his company. They're a roundtable rewards vendors, so they offer rebates on most of their services. So if you're going to use them, make sure you uh, submit that to the rebate program. Uh, Kirk's going to share a number of strategies that will help you grow and improve customer ret retention. Um, if you'd like to submit questions, feel free. Uh, use the Q&A button. And then once Kirk concludes his presentation, he'll address those questions. So let's get this show on the road. Here's Kirk. Hello, everyone, and thank you for your time. I know time is valuable, especially running businesses. I run my own, and uh, there's never enough time in the day. Uh, but the topic we're going to talk about today is how to keep customers for life. And uh, it's a big deal, especially in your industry. Um, you've got lots of challenges um, besides the cyclical nature of your business. Um, it's uh, really hard to get new customers. It's really hard to attract them. Um, there's all kinds of... Uh, industry experts out in the world that will tell you that it costs anywhere from 250 to $400 to get a new customer, and um, it's definitely a, a valuable um, business model if you can keep them, those customers for life. So with that being said, I'm proud to be here today, and um, we're going to go through uh, just a, a few bullet points here. Um, we want to talk about why the reason why, and obviously the reason why is because we need uh, those customers to consistently remember us and remember to call our company, as well as to make sure that um, that uh, relationship is a win-win for both uh, your company and your customers. We're also going to talk about just a few questions here, just kind of make sure we're all on the same page. And then we're going to talk about how the marketing principles have changed, because they've changed a lot over the last 10 years. Um, we're going to show you some real life examples of what works and how these programs generate leads. And then we're going to talk about the cost just to make sure you know uh, the cost uh, equation on how much it costs to retain a customer and how you could go about doing that yourself. Um, so with that being said, the first thing we want to talk about is the four reasons why. There's, uh, there's three very good reasons. The first three reasons are is that without a contact management system in place, without a CRM system in place, every four new customers you get, statistically, three out of those four new customers will never call you back again. So it's really important to, uh, to maintain those relationships. And with a good continuity program, a, a good continuity with your customer base, a good contact management system, we can actually see that repeat customer rate increase and increase and our goal is to always exceed 60% repeat customer rate, which is roughly uh, three times what you would get without a contact management system. And I love service agreements. I think that they're a great product and a great service. Um, I think it's a win-win for your company so that at the beginning of the month, you, you start out with some revenue being put in the bank. Uh, but it's also a great win for the customer, um, and especially a specific type of customer that you're already working with today and you might not have got them onto a service agreement yet. And I've done lots of these database evaluations for companies, contractors throughout the United States, as well as some in Canada. And um, I can look through all the financials, I can look through all the numbers, I can look through all the tickets, I can see their average ticket amounts and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you can run a, a, uh, a business successfully as a service organization but where you're really going to thrive is by selling more equipment. And we're going to talk about how to sell more equipment today. If you can retain a customer through a couple sets of uh, equipment, so you're talking maybe 10 to 15 years, and you actually sell first set of equipment and then a second set of equipment, that customer value is very big. Right. You got uh, roughly $40,000 in value in that, in that household. And the more services that your company offers, if you do heating and cooling and then heating, cooling, plumbing, and heating, cooling, plumbing, electrical, maybe some generators or, or even just simply water heaters, the more services that your company offers, 
the more value is in that household. And um, if you look at the fact right here where it says, uh, right under the calculator, it says the market attrition costs, so customer to a truck to get a new customer, you're talking between $250 and $450. Now, if you're in a real rural area, the good news is, is it's, you're on the lower end. If you're in a really highly dense um, city type environment, it's on the higher side. But if you don't make back that $250 to $450 in profit on that first ticket, um, you really need that customer to come back more than once just so you can break even on that customer acquisition cost. So we're going to talk about that and how we're going to do this uh, moving forward and how you can do it successfully. The first thing you want to think of is are all customers the same? And of course, we all know that every day. Some customers are a lot of fun. Some customers, not so much. But um, you ultimately have thousands, if not tens of thousands, of customers in your database. And those customers actually kind of fall naturally into about five different buckets. So you've got your service agreement customers, those are your fan base, those are your loyal customers. Um, there, there is an actual uh, trend where it seems to be older uh, generation um, people are more into service agreements. And the younger generation, the millennials, the ones buying houses now, as well as the Gen Xers are not as popular for service agreements. But then you also get, every once in a while, you get the opportunity to bring in a new customer. And you want to make that a very special um, a very special thing. You got to promote that, maybe ring a bell internally and say, hey, we got a new customer and um, make sure that CSR communicates that to the technician or, or, the, or whoever's going to the house. Make sure they know, hey, this is a new customer. It's the first time working with them. Make sure that they do everything right, um, right out of the gate because you really only get one first impression. And for those companies that have been in business for quite a while, you've accumulated a lot of data. And um, if you've been relatively diligent at recording the install dates, maybe equipment that you've installed, but also kind of getting your technicians into a habit that anytime they're in the house, you know, recording down, because there's usually stickers on the equipment, recording down when the equipment is installed is an extremely powerful piece of information. So if you're not doing that today, please start doing it um, tomorrow because um, just having that information is going to allow you to, to really fish in a bucket and kind of predict how many new pieces of equipment you're going to sell every year. On, on the other side of it, we have those repeat customers. You know, you can look through your Rolodex, you can look through your database, you can look through, you know, export in Excel and scan through it. And you can see that these, these certain level of customers consistently buy from you at least once a year. That is the ideal customer to be to be pitching the service agreement to. Because not only can you save them money, but you've also created that, that loyalty, that bond, that relationship with the customer that, um, that you, can't, um, you can't really replace. Um, so getting those loyal repeat customers into a service agreement is a win-win for both you and the customer. And then last but not least, you know, we talk about um, selling more equipment. Um, and a customer with, with really old equipment, um, we know what's going to happen, right? We know either they're going to replace the equipment or they're going to have high dollar uh, repairs. So making sure that you're kind of looking at your customer in these five windows and saying, hey, where does this customer fit? And then hopefully those new customers become repeat customers. Those repeat customers become service agreement customers. And you consistently are selling more and more equipment as well as maintaining you know, top class uh, service organizations, that's very powerful. The other question we want to ask ourselves is, is, you know, of course, do customers spend the same? And we, we all know the answer is no. And it's actually pretty shocking. Um, almost everything in life comes down to some kind of form of an 80-20 rule. But when we do the analysis and, and our, our contractors give us their entire database and we can scroll through all this stuff and we start, um, kind of pulling the data apart and looking at it, it almost comes down to 2080, which means 20% of those customers, those repeat customers, those service agreement customers, are really making up that 80% of your sales. So we know that there's a whole lot of value in there, but there's also a whole lot of opportunity, because if you've got only 20% of your customers generating 80% of your revenue, 
just a few more percent increase can make a big, a big impact on your top line number as well as your profit number. The next question we gotta ask ourselves is, is the sales process the same for every customer? Of course we know the answer is no. Some customers um, wanna do a, um, a tune-up and kind of you know, build that level of trust. And um, although it probably happens every day, uh, we see an ongoing trend that there's usually two to three service calls before someone will invest in new equipment. So if you know that up front, understand that it's great to get that sale on the equipment, but you're probably gonna have to fix the equipment a couple times. You're probably gonna have to provide world-class service to that customer a couple times before they're willing to open up their, their checkbook and, and write out checks for thousands of dollars worth of equipment. So it's just something to know that um, not every customer uh, follows the same process, but there is some consistency and some tracking through that. We also want to look at this and say, okay, if we know that there's five buckets of, of people, and we know some of those buckets kind of overlap and people move between those buckets, you wouldn't want to communicate with them all the same way. Um, and and I, I, I use this example all the time, and I guarantee you it's, it's happening today while we're on the phone. Uh, somebody's receiving mail, um, giving them a special coupon for their, uh, for their AC tune-up, for those contractors that are ahead of the curve, for their AC tune-up, and uh, they're on a service agreement. So you pretty much just told them, hey, don't, don't pay that service agreement price. Let's just wait and get a coupon for a cheaper price. So we want to make sure that we're marketing the right message to the right audience. And for those, for those of you who are older, like myself, and maybe even older than me, you've probably heard in the past that it takes you know, a half a dozen times, six to seven times, for a customer to, to really react to marketing. And unfortunately, that number is only growing over the last 10 years, you know, between social media and um, you know, 4,000 channels, between uh, Comcast and Netflix and everything in the world. Um, as well as smartphones, customers are literally receiving hundreds of advertisements every day, which makes it even harder to kind of ring through and stay consistent. Um, so unfortunately, I'd love to tell you that I can do it in two, uh, two touch points, we could get a customer react, but that's just not the case. So if, if, you, uh, if you're thinking about sending out a thousand piece mailer one time, um, you might want to reconsider that, uh, you, you want to probably cut that number down by, a fi by five and send out 200 mailers and then send out you know, the same, same 200 households send out that same mailer or slightly different mailer five different times because you know it's hard to ring through. Now the great news is you guys mostly, most, most everybody on the phone's probably got trucks driving around which is an awesome billboard. If anybody doesn't have their truck wrapped, uh, please give me a call. I'd like to put my company on your truck. Um, but um, the truth of it is, is that that can help with a couple of the impressions, but we also know everybody's extremely busy. We're all doing five things while we're driving a car, and we just need to make sure that everything is, is consistent. When you do have an exciting event like a new customer, and you probably did this early on in your career, you probably did this when maybe when you first started your heating and cooling company or you bought your heating and cooling company, when you got a new customer, you probably sat down and sent out a thank you card. Um, or maybe your salesperson, every time they sold equipment, they sent out a thank you card. And everyone in the world has the best intentions, but the truth is, is that without a process in place, it's very hard to be consistent. If, if, uh, if a salesperson has you know, a dozen uh, thank you cards to write out for his customers that bought equipment in the last week, but he's got three appointments today, um, because traditionally they're commission-based, they're gonna be going to those appointments before they're writing out any thank you cards. So just understand, a new customer is an exciting event. You got a $400 conversion that has now become a customer and you wanna make sure that you really wow them right out of the gate. We also strongly recommend that you survey. And, and a survey is very valuable because it gathers all kinds of information but it, you also need a way for that, all those survey results to kind of be compiled and analyzed. And you can find out pretty quickly with, with surveying your customers 
Um, if you've got issues that you need to resolve, if you've got maybe one technician that, that is not um, the same as the other technicians. But the other, the other real value of surveying your service customers, especially a new customer, is just to make sure that everything went right. Um, you guys, you probably all travel, and, and when you stay in hotels, and you get back, you got rental car, uh, hotels, and airlines, and they're all sending you uh, surveys. And the reason they do that is because they know most of you won't fill them out. I don't fill them out anymore. Um, but they know that by sending you a survey, you're more likely to buy from them again, because you feel like if there is an issue, you're going to be able to have your voice heard. And when we talk about that, we really want to make sure that every survey, we're looking at three things, right? So we're, we're really looking at, are they satisfied? Um, do they have, um, are they a high net promoter score? We also want to evaluate any strengths and weaknesses right away, but we also want to give the customer the ability to voice any, any options, you know, any opinions, any concerns. You would much rather a disgruntled customer blast you on a survey that only your company sees than to jump on Yelp and, and tell the world, because that's going to cost you a lot more in the long run. And even though we're not, um, we're not direct competitors to, uh, to the companies out there that do the uh, online testimonials and the, uh, the uh, various different review uh, organizations, when we do get a phenomenal testimonial um, that comes back on a survey, you really need to get that testimonial online. Uh, get it up there on your website, get it on your social media sites. Um, there's Anytime you get a great word, you want to make sure that the world can see it and um, make sure that that just doesn't, you know, maybe you read it, but then you didn't do anything with that testimonial where you missed an opportunity to put that, broadcast that on the, on the World Wide Web just a few minutes and you got it done. And if you do get those referrals that come back, those testimonials that come back, um, we recommend that you keep it concise. You know, I, I recommend you fix any spelling errors, but try to keep the message exactly the way it's written on a survey or typed onto a survey. Uh, also, we recommend abbreviating the customer's name and just listing the township that they're in. Uh, we don't need to be listing uh, the full customer's name and the mailing address. Uh, and then posting that online. So we recommend that you keep it professional and concise. But again, anytime you get a new customer, it's something to to celebrate. And anytime you get an online review or a testimonial that you can publish, it's also an exciting time. Now, when we talk about uh, all the communication here throughout um, throughout proven customer relationship management, contact management systems. Um, it sounds elementary, but the more times you ask for a referral, the more you will get them. Um, and every time you communicate uh, with a, a past customer or prospect, it's strongly encouraged that you would highlight all of your services. Um, many contractors have actually gone and added services, but you know, less than 5% of their customer base actually realizes that they can now help them with plumbing or electrical or anything else. So my, my, my recommendation here on this slide is just simply make sure that you're asking for referrals on all of your communication with your, your past customers and even, even uh, referral partners, as well as make sure that you're highlighting all of your services because we want to make sure that everyone that you're communicating with knows Who's the right company to call when they have an issue with whatever it is? We also have to ask ourselves, do we want to stand out? Do we want to be remembered? If you've got a huge marketing budget and you don't care, maybe, maybe you don't worry about standing out, and maybe you're willing to pay Google to be at the very top of the page. But that is very expensive. And um, if, you, uh, if you want to bid on a pay-per-click for no heat, um, that's going to cost you a lot of money, especially if you can't convert those leads. So you'd much rather have a past customer, you know, Googling, hey, I'm, I'm trying to get in touch with my customer, and they're actually Googling your company name. You'd much rather them Google your company name than, than just um, stating the issue that they're having in, into a, a web browser. So it's a, it's a much better um, 
conversion for you. So we really want to look next at the data. Okay, um, data scares most people uh, and intimidates most people. Uh, most people are very bad at data. Um, when we look at co uh, contractors' databases, you know we can find you know 13 different um, 13 different um, new contacts for the same household. So there's a lot of room for improvement, not only in your businesses but in mine too. And uh, making sure that um, you're really building that that data um, consistently and accurately, following best practices, making sure they're looking for that house before they just create a new contact in your in your software. And we also know that by tapping into that data, you can quickly reference like who's bought recently and who hasn't, and you can actually start generating leads pretty quickly just by mining your own data with the right communication and, and the right messaging. So analyzing the data is hard. Um, it takes a lot of time. We're writing software all the time, our, my own company, to do predictive modeling. But um, if you really dive in the data, you can actually start predicting you know, who's going to call you next. You can actually start predicting um, who is a consistent repeat customer, which would be great to get on a service agreement. And you know, if you've got that age of the equipment or that install date in your software, you can really start identifying which, um, which customers are going to need that new equipment. I know some contractors have already done this. They, they go through their data. They, they mine that data. They send out you know, letters. Um, but when you send that letter out, you need to consistently continue to communicate. Because when you send that letter out, they may not be having any problems, and it may go right in the round file. Um, but you need to consistently communicate with, the, with those customers. And those that, customers that you know have older equipment, um, you need to be even a little bit more aggressive with that. And you don't know where your next referral is coming from. And in most cases, referrals are almost impossible to track. Um, you know, people get married, they change their name, and, and the sister gives a referral to somebody else. So you constantly have to be on your game. Every day when I'm walking up the stairs to come into my office, I always think it's game time because you've got to do the absolute best you can do to make sure that you're, you're um, setting yourself up for more referrals and, and more repeat business. So, but really what we're talking about is really just segmenting your database. So if you're taking away anything from this, from this presentation today, we're talking about segmenting your database and just sending the right message to the right audience. And it sounds simple, not always easy to do, but you can do it if you're, if you're willing to spend a little bit of time and kind of work on the, on the business and not in the business. Because there's a lot of opportunity also, not just with repeat business on the same equipment, but cross-selling. You know, we have uh, air humidifiers and we've got air purifiers and we've got all kinds of uh, additional services that could be... Uh, putting up sheet metal or you know maybe more insulation. I mean, we've got all these different services that we offer, but yet we're constantly just doing the same thing over and over again. And if we just communicated and let our customers really know all the different things that we have, uh, the more cross-selling we would have. And we know that for you to be really successful, you have to sell more equipment. Getting more service calls, obviously, what you what you want that is what is kind of the foundation of your business that's what keeps everybody's paycheck going but selling more equipment is where you can really start growing and reinvesting in your company spending more in marketing hiring more people maybe buying uh, paying up a little bit for an employee that's worth it and we also know that those service agreements anytime you have a pattern between a repeat customer and you see that hey you know mrs. Jones calls us every year um, but she's never been on a service agreement. Um, just taking that extra few minutes to explain the real value behind a service agreement is powerful. And, and I also heard the horror stories, you know, the contractors like, well, we, we, uh, we sell a lot of service agreements, but nobody renews. Well, you could be doing yourself a, a, a disservice if you're costing yourself profit to sell service agreements. So if you have an $800 repair and you say, hey, you know what, if you sign up for the service agreement, your bill today is only $600. You're, 
you're actually destroying your own service agreement reputation. So um, I'm sure people on the phone here are probably not doing that, but you, re you really want to think about the value proposition and make sure you're constantly communicating that internally. Uh, we have monthly meetings in my company. We have all kinds of meetings just like in your company, and we're constantly reiterating the same thing, um, trying to make sure that the messaging is concise and, and everything's running smoothly. And the truth is, is when you ask one of my staff, hey, what's going on with this company? Most people don't even know what we're talking about. So just have to keep rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, because you don't want somebody uh, to get a $10 spiff but destroy your service agreement value prop, because that's going to make it much harder to sell in the long run. Now, we also know that there are times, um, it might be this time of the year for your company, depending on what state you're in, but there is times where you have to pony up and do the pay-per-click. Um, you've, got, you've got employees in the building, um, you don't have, the phone's not ringing, and you have to just say, you know what, I've got to throw some money at pay-per-click and try to get some, get my guys out on the road. And, and it's kind of a necessary evil nowadays, uh, especially during those non-peak um, weather events. You, you just kind of have to step up and do that. But if you think about, if you could get only 20 calls a day, do you want those 20 calls to be somebody who saw an ad online who has no relationship with you? Or would you rather people call you back and say, hi, I'm a repeat customer and I've got a problem. Can you please come out? So the answer is, is that the leads that you're going to generate through a really solid CRM, customer relationship management system, is going to be far superior to the pay-per-click where you're going to get maybe one out of 10 or one out of 20 that actually will let you schedule an appointment, uh, schedule a service call. Again, I, I can't reiterate this enough. Your customers are really your salespeople. Um, when you do an awesome job for a customer and they don't feel like you overcharged and they feel like you were fair and they feel like you gave them options, those people are talking all the time. They're talking on social media. They're talking to their families. They're talking to their friends. They're talking to their coworkers. And you really want to make sure that you've got training in, in place for your staff. You want to make sure you're following best practices. You're really wanting to do the absolute best job you can for every call, every, tech, every service ticket, because those people are ultimately your salespeople. And those, those referrals are worth a lot more than somebody clicking on an ad that you paid you know, $8 to get clicked on. So really what we want to do with a good, solid contact management system is to try to even it out, right? Um, there's, no, there's no way anyone in the world can say, I can even it out 100% across all 12 months because your business um, is very much... You know, when it's really hot and really cold, you're working 18-hour days, and when it's not, you can actually go on vacation. So it's, um, we can even it out with, with really good principles and technician, you know, communication, getting those loyal customers to, uh, and those service agreement customers to get their appointments and their preventative maintenance scheduled earlier in the year during not peak season. So you can do that with a good communication system. But there's always going to be that extreme weather that's going to put you into uh, into uh, crunch mode. So it's just, I, I can't, I haven't seen anybody in the world be able to kind of pull it off and even it out more, more uh, consistently across 12 months. So when you think about a communication system, and this is maybe for a repeat business customer or maybe a brand new customer, you really want to start out with a very concise um, marketing um, type of campaign, a very simple, clear communication system, and you have to do it consistently. You know, we, we see this all the time where, oh, this CSR also does our marketing, and then the phones blow up, and, and they don't send out the mailer, or they send out the spring postcard in the summer. Um, if they even do send it out, sometimes they get so far past that point of the year, and they go, oh, we'll just skip it this time. And you really need to consistently communicate with the same branding, the same image, uh, the, same, the same style. Um, this is not a sprint. This is very much a marathon. 
You've got uh, your really your goal is is to take that database of yours and get it get it spot on, get it organized, get it cleaned up, and you're really looking for 60 to 75 percent of your customers buying from you at least once a year. Um, I've heard other people say this, and the data doesn't lie. The data shows the same thing. If if they're not buying from you in three years, they're probably buying from somebody else. So um, you don't have that luxury of saying, okay, I'm going to send out a mailer every four years or, you know, once a year and hopefully they're going to remember me because you also get in a situation where the wife gets the mailer, but the husband schedules a call or vice versa. I know most um, service calls are scheduled by the females, but my point is, is that you have to be consistent and communicate and the messaging on a, on a simple customer relationship platform should have a very small call to action. You're talking twenty, twenty-five dollars. Um, I've had contractors do funny things like twenty-nine, twenty-nine loyal customer discount. Uh, but you're looking at a very small call to action. And then the funny thing is, is half the people that got the coupon and called your company, they don't even turn the coupon in to save the money. So then you say, well, okay, if they're not even going to use the coupon, why would I send one out? Well, the reason you put that twenty-five dollars off is because you want to be able to put an expiration date with that, with that offer. And when you put an expiration date on an offer, you ultimately added shelf life to that marketing. So if you give somebody two, two months to, um, to use their $25 coupon, guess what? They don't know if their furnace is going to work next week, and they don't know if their air conditioning unit is going to work next week. So they're going to put that postcard on the table. They're going to put that postcard on the counter. They're going to save that email in their inbox. They're going to save that communication. They may even, you know, magnet it right to the refrigerator, which is just awesome when I see that happen all the time. Um, but you really, the reason you're putting this small call to action on the customer is because they're our repeat customer or a new customer. Um, you're not expecting to have a problem. Maybe you just provided service. But you're wanting them to constantly remember, hey, save this. Keep this around so that in the event you have an issue, make sure you call us first. Don't go to Google and pay-per-click. Uh, because I may not have the biggest pay-per-click budget that week, and then you're going to go to my competitor. So save this communication, and, and let's um, when you do call, let me know you got that $25 off coupon so that we know that you're a repeat customer and we can get you priority service. The next thing that we, we call the intelligent database, and unfortunately, um, at least my experience so far, I've been here almost seven years, is only about 10% of the contractors um, actually have enough data for us to be able to facilitate an intelligent database program. But really, when you think about you know doing a, an aggressive campaign like this, where you're talking about you know practically a dozen mailers a year and a dozen emails a year and, and surveys and all kinds of stuff, you're really fishing in a bucket is what you're doing. You know that that is not a service agreement customer you know that that customer has older equipment, and you know what? You're, you're ponying up. You're paying an extra, extra 30, 40, 50 cents uh, a month to market to that customer, um, and, you, and you're really wanting to segment that data out, right? You don't want them to get the other communication. You want them to get the communication that's very focused on either a high ticket repair or replacement. So if you're going to segment your database and you're going to focus on those non-service agreement customers with older equipment, um, you kind of got to go big or you got to go home. Um, you need to have a higher call to action, maybe a hundred dollar off a repair. And, and I've seen guys do it with limits. So you can say a hundred dollars off with at least a $300 repair. Um, and you also need to have those, those rebates, those big numbers, save $2,000 on a complete system. You know, I've seen numbers as high as three thousand dollars on a on a full home efficient system, but you're really wanting to message to that customer because you know their their situation, right? You know they're not a service screen customer. You know that they have equipment that's older and time is ticking, right? So you want to make sure that you're messaging to them, saying, "Hey, if you've got a big repair, call us. We'll save you hundred bucks." But if it's time to upgrade, which it is, because we know it is. Um, you're going to save a couple thousand dollars. You just you're trying to get that multi-thousand dollar sale, that equipment sale, in on your books and not the guy's books down the street. And and that's really what I want to 
reiterate is, is there's a ton of value in segmented data. It's a little bit difficult, but you can do it. You really want to market to that household in a more aggressive fashion. And then we have to we have to talk about those people that you just installed new equipment for. So they bought, you can ring the bell in your office, uh, they bought a furnace and an AC combination unit, maybe you did a little bit of ductwork cleanup or sealed some ducts or whatever. They paid up, right? They gave you six, 10 grand, whatever the number is, I don't really care, uh, but they've already bought, okay? So we don't want to send that person coupons anymore, okay? And, and I bet it's happened to many people on this phone is you literally get a customer, you just installed a $7,000 unit, you, you installed it last week, and they got a coupon from you saying they could have saved a 1000 bucks if they would have waited just three more days, right? And then you've not only destroyed that relationship, but you've also alienated that customer. So instead of them saying, hey, they showed up on time, they wore booties, they installed it in one day, they installed it the next morning, the company was awesome, they were reasonable, they gave me options. Instead of them saying that, them saying, hey, I got ripped off $1,000 by this company because you know, right after I had my system installed, then they offered a coupon and they wouldn't honor it, right? So please understand that segmenting the data, although it's a little bit of work, is really valuable because if you're gonna spend $400 to get a new customer, you don't wanna alienate that customer. The other thing is, is when they buy new equipment, Lord knows, we all hope, that they're not going to need your services right away, right? I mean, they just bought a new system, hopefully Train and Carrier and, and, and Ream and Rudd and, and all those guys, you know, made great equipment and they shouldn't have a problem for years to come. But there's also something psychological about this. The more money they spend with you, the more likely they are to refer you. And this whole system, if you communicate, if you segment that data, you take those install customers out of the normal marketing stream, you message to them, you don't even need to include coupons. You just need to include the right messaging, like make sure you stay on the service agreement, make sure you're getting your equipment maintained. You know, the equipment nowadays is, you know, highly um, technical, it's very finicky, we need to maintain it. You would not want to void your warranty. With that kind of messaging, you don't have to put coupons on it. They've already bought the, the equipment. You just want to make sure that you're asking for them for referrals because they're the most likely the ones to give you referrals. But you're also wanting to make sure that you're telling them the right, the right thing to do. Get your equipment maintained. Get your service agreement. Stay on your service agreement. Don't void your warranty. And that's a powerful enough message to get it to work. The other nice thing about those install customers is, is the more marketing you have going out to those install customers, that becomes a referral and repeat customer machine. So these people that invested $7,000 or $8,000 with you in the past, they're not going to be as price sensitive if they have a $400 repair or somebody else might. So you have to kind of look at your customer and say, these are my most valuable customers. They've given us the most amount of money. So you know what? I'm willing to invest a little bit of money. I'm willing to invest splitting the data up. I'm willing to invest doing a slightly different marketing campaign to that household because they already bought and they're, they're my elite customers and those are the ones that are gonna give me more referrals than anybody else. And these are just examples of how these systems work. The other thing I wanna reiterate is, is that all of these different programs that I just showed you, they're all personalized to an actual person. So not just Mr. John and Mary Smith, but they're personalized from the person who came to the house either the technician or the primary technician that came to the house that did the service, also um, the salesperson that sat at the kitchen table and, and explained those options or maybe stood at the counter and explained those options. Sending the communication from an actual person and not just from your company, according to the Direct Marketing Association of the United States, doubles your, re your uh, effectiveness in your marketing, doubles. Okay? Wouldn't we all like to double our results from our marketing? Well, just by taking that little bit of extra effort and adding a face to your company can double your marketing. It can double the results. So it's hard to track marketing. I, I know it is. But at the end of the day, the data doesn't lie. You know, our customers, at the end of our first year with our customers, we always say, let us do a, a database evaluation. Let us do a roll-up. Let us look at the data and see how many of these customers came back. 
how many of these customers came back and what did they buy? Did they get on service agreements or whatever? And when, whenever we do one of these roll-ups, you know, the numbers are huge. I mean, they're just, they're just crazy because just re-engaging with that 10% of your customers that practically forgot about your company can make a huge impact on your top line and your profit. And these are just a little bit of examples here. You know, we're still branding things for the company, right? I mean, it's all about your company. You want the brand to be consistent. You want it to match your website. You want it to represent uh, and mimic your, your trucks and your vans. But just taking it down one more level of a one-on-one, -on -one, a one-to-one -one marketing is what they call this, one-to-one -one communication is extremely powerful because when, when a customer calls back, they say, you know what? I'm calling this company because they were fair last time, but really because Matt was so nice, right? Um, so just adding that different level of, of marketing, a little bit level of effort is also just big impact on, on the effectiveness of the marketing. And then we also have to talk about data, right? So data is, in my opinion, data is 75% uh, percent of the marketing. So, it, you know, the garbage in, garbage out is what people say. But you have to get into a, um, a routine of scrubbing your data, cleaning up your data, um, making sure that you're looking for people who've moved. Uh, you're looking for, you know, addresses that are wrong. Um, making sure that that address in your database will standardize where they can add the zip for at the end of the five-digit zip. That can also give you not only a, a feeling of like, hey, I know I've got good marketing data, I've got good customer data, but it can also make sure that that piece gets delivered because about a year and a half, two years ago, the United States Postal Service um, incorporated intelligent barcodes. And um, that was a big deal for us, cost us 100 grand, but at the end of the day, we can now track that the mailer actually got delivered to a house by using these intelligent barcodes. So. There's a lot to it, but having good, clean data is going to help your marketing be more effective. Now, I tell people, I tell contractors all the time, that I believe the best way to get new customers is with through the website, right? Through pay-per-click, through SEO, keeping your website high ranked in that area, in your service area. I believe that's the best way to get new customers. But if you're in a more rural area, Print mail very much worse. You just have to do bigger volume. You have to do bigger quantities. Um, you have to send out several hundred pieces, and you have to do it multiple times over and over again. And when you're, if you're going to invest in marketing to prospects, so these are not past customers, but prospects, think of your customer, your potential customer, and make it easy for them. Give them a website on the, on the marketing that says, hey, you can go to this website and schedule my appointment. Go to this website and schedule uh, request information. Make sure your phone number is very clear and concise. Uh, whatever possible, try to give them another way where if it's not an urgent issue that they can check a box and mail it back, right? It may take a couple days to get back, but they're not mailing it to your competitor. They're only mailing it back to you. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to make you know, one piece of marketing actually have multiple ways to generate leads. And this is just an example of some of that. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, radius marketing, okay? Uh, there's been lots of companies that have done this wrong in the past. Um, and I just want to tell you from my opinion, that's all I can tell you today is my opinion. My opinion is if you're going to do radius marketing, uh, you should do radius marketing to only 25 households around an install, okay? And you should also have that radius mailing represent the salesperson who sold that job, okay? So if, if Johnny is the one who went out and, and explained those six different options to their customer and the guy bought or the, the husband and wife bought the equipment, let's send out that postcard to 25 neighbors of that house and let's put Johnny's photo on there, and let's list the address of where the equipment is installed. You're lucky you're not in the financial industry. For our mortgage customers, we can't put the address. But in the contractor industry, you very much can put the address. We installed new equipment at Mr. and Mrs. Jones' house at 1234 Main Street. 
odds are your house is a similar age with similar age equipment. Please give us a call and Johnny will be, come, be happy to come out and give you an estimate on what, how to get your home more energy efficient, right? Now, if you're going to be doing prospect marketing, so this is either, either the larger quantity where you've got to hit them multiple times, like the previous slide, or you're going to do just the 25 mailers around an install, um, this is also a situation where you've got to go big or go home. Like either, either go big or don't do it at all. So you have to have a really strong call to action here because you're really wanting to get a prospect, somebody who may be neighbors to your customer but has never used your company before. You're trying, to, you're trying to steal them away from another contractor, really. You're trying to steal that. You're trying to earn that business over. And there's going to be a little bit of a payment to that, and that's kind of how that $400 um, to customer acquisition cost is usually calculated. So if you are going to do radius marketing, I recommend only 25 around an install from the salesperson who sold that job because the neighbors, especially in the spring and the summer and the fall, they will actually ask that customer what Johnny was like. And so you want to make sure that that's correlated correctly. The last thing I want to talk about is if you're going to farm, right, so you're going to farm market, you've got um, maybe you're in a service area of 30,000 households, Maybe you've got uh, 5,000 households already in your database. Um, I strongly recommend that you fish around your business, only in your service area. Uh, just because somebody says, hey, they'll drop you know, 100,000 pieces for you for 40 grand, um, that, is probably, um, that is probably a scary, a scary calculation because the only way they could send out 100,000 mailers if your service area is 30,000 is if they're going to drive your trucks clear across town into other service areas and cost you more money in the long run. I had a customer about three years ago who told me, hey, we're going to double our service area next year. And I asked him, well, what kind of loan did you get from the bank? Because you're going to have to spend a ton of money to double your service area if you're going to try to do it in a year. It's much more wise to slowly grow your service area over time as your business grows and therefore, if you're going to do prospecting marketing, use demographics, use polygons, you know, wrap, wrap those, uh, those households around your business, and then deselect people who have newer homes and deselect apartments and deselect trailer parks and, and make sure that your data that you're going to market to is really gives you the best chance of success. Because just because that guy down the street, that contractor that services the town two, two towns over, seems like he's making a lot of money. If you go over and try to compete with him, it's going to cost you dearly, unless you can grow your service area slowly over time. And then last but not least here, we've got to talk about what it's going to cost. Okay? Data is very intimidating to people. So if you think you're going to hire um, a, a $10 an hour employee and they're going to be able to split up all your data and kind of figure it all out for you, you're, you're probably very wrong. Um, if, you, if you guys know about, uh, if the contracts in the call are familiar with DISC, which is, stands for D-I-S-C, talks about different personality types, you're really looking for a C-type person to be able to work with the data, somebody like an accountant or a CPA or, or maybe that really attention to detail type person in your office. That is probably the best person to work with the data. And then once they get the data out of your system, which can be a challenge in itself, once they get out of their system and they get it into different segments, then you're going to have to hire a marketing person. A really good marketing person is going to be at least 60 grand. I'm not talking about a $30,000 um, marketing person who just graduated college. I'm talking about somebody who's been around and sees what works. You're also going to need a graphic designer. Unfortunately, these are not usually the same person. If you hire a graphic designer and ask them to do marketing, they're going to be really creative and not get it done. Right? If you ask somebody to do the marketing, they're going to help drive the graphic design, but they're actually going to follow up like a project manager and actually make sure the marketing gets out on time. So it's almost two different personalities. Now, the good news is there's lots of printing companies in the world, so if you just want to do printing companies, you can go out there and uh, maybe pre-buy, buy in bulk, maybe do offset printing, and you can invest in a lot of marketing. And then, of course, you can't really negotiate with the United States government, so you're going to have to pay for that postage. But you're going to also have to give that marketing person more tools, right? So you have to go 
hire, uh, you know, get them some email marketing software, right? And then you maybe have to get them some survey software. And of course, you know, if you wanna if you wanna build the email marketing and software company's business, you know, go with the less expensive version. Um, but if you want to build your own business, you would want to get you'd want to pay up for that service to at least get their name off and your name at the bottom. And then the next thing is is when you roll all this stuff all together, just to market, you know, to consistently to five thousand households. Um, maybe in four different buckets, you're really looking at at least a hundred twenty thousand dollar investment. And then, of course, if you do say, you know what, that's the right thing for me. We're going to spend one hundred twenty grand. We're going to do this. Um, understand, you've got to find the right person who knows what to do because if they're doing it wrong, it's going to cost you a lot more than one hundred twenty grand. And then, of course, there are companies like mine who can help you. Um, you know, we have software, systems, programming, and coding that can make this a lot less expensive. And just based on the fact that I've got more servers than employees, I have a hard time believing that you could do it less expensive. But before, before I close, I want to just leave you with one thought. The thought is, is that if you're on the cusp of switching software, okay, and again, I'm not, I'm not competing with these companies, but if you're considering switching software, Please look at that software and see how easy it is to export data. These companies make it pretty easy. These software platforms make it really easy to get the data out. But whatever software you want to switch to, I don't really care. But there's going to be a lot of need to be able to export data, look at it more granularly, get it into Excel. And if your software that you're using makes it almost impossible to get the data out of your system, you're really cutting off your nose to spite your face. So with that being said, I, I thank everyone for their time. Um, got about 10 minutes there for questions, and I'll be happy to answer any question you want to ask. Well, Kirk, that was, uh, that was really good. Um, um, my background's primarily in marketing, and uh, I was uh, glued to my computer screen. I thought that you did a great job. Um, thank you, sir. The... Uh, you mentioned the five types of uh, customers you've got and how to, and you want to segment those five. Um, I assume if you have, uh, if you have multiple divisions, you're going to have multiples of five, ten, five for HVAC, five for plumbing, five for electrical. Would that be correct? And uh, you, you, yeah. If, if they're different locations, yes. However, if they're the same location, um, you really want to look at what services those households are buying. Think of it as a bank. You know, we work with a lot of banks, um, and they call it wallet share. So just because this person has a checking and savings account doesn't mean they have a credit card, doesn't mean they have their mortgage with them, doesn't that mean they have their auto loan with them. And you're really wanting to kind of cross-sell all your services to the same households because you're really trying to get more of that service business in the, in, into your company. Right. So by actually analyzing that, you know, per customer, maybe you think of it as like the left column, column A is all the customer's names, and column B, C, D, and E are the different divisions that you have. If you can actually get the data out of your software, which may be impossible in some cases, but if you can get it out and match it up, then you can see, hey, these people, 70% of my customers call me for furnaces, and all these other services are not being used by any of these 70, right? Mm -hmm. So that helps you kind of target market those, those customers with the right message. Yeah, and I, I may have uh, said it wrong. So you don't necessarily need 10 different segments for two different divisions, but you do need to know which ones are, you, are ideally, know which ones have used plumbing and which ones have used air conditioning. Um, some of our most successful stuff has been marketing one to the other group. One to the other. Yeah. Yes. Cause you already got the customer. Yep. So you're saying, Hey, you already trust me here. Yep. Did you know I can help you here too? And it's, it's actually, it's a really solid way to grow your business. Absolutely. So. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you, you, you quickly touched on destroying your service agreement value proposition by discounting at the time of the, of the sale. Can you t go into that a little bit more? Yeah, and, and I please, you know, if somebody has done that or is currently doing that, please, I, I mean no harm by that. But we actually see um, 
people falling off service agreements that have been on them for four years. And um, we actually trigger, for our system, we trigger what's called an evaluation survey that goes out and says, hey, what happened? Um, why, did you, why did you stop? Why did you drop your service agreement? And that is the number one comment we get back on that third-party survey. It says, well, I've been paying $200 a year or $240 a year, but then I got a coupon that says I only have to pay 80 bucks. So that's not mm -hmm. only you're going to lose the service agreement business, but you're going to lose that customer because they feel like you've taken advantage of them for the last three years, which really you weren't. You, it was just a different product. Yep. Yep. All right. Excellent. Um, I don't see any other questions, so I guess uh, everybody's good, Kirk. So, um, again, thanks for coming on. I uh, thought it was great. Uh, maybe we can get you on again down the road sometime. Um, and hopefully we'll, uh, you uh, may get some new customers out of this uh, event. I thought uh, there's a lot of our members who could use this type of stuff. Thank you, sir. And um, we, we really did. I mean, we've been talking back and forth with, with Mike, uh, Liz, and, and Jill for a couple years. And it was actually one of our, one of our customers that actually kind of helped the catapult to get us as a preferred member uh, last quarter. And um, I really appreciate them helping us kind of get that, get that in place. And now we're going to be able to give lots of contractors that we already do business with uh, those rebates as well as future contractors. So I'm proud to be a service roundtable partner. Absolutely. Hey, uh, we did have one question just pop up. What's the easiest way to get started in a program like this? Um, the easiest thing to do is to pick up the phone and call me. Um, but if you don't want to do that, you want to try to do it yourself, you really have to kind of figure out how to get the data out of your software. Um, Service Titan makes it easy. Those other companies, uh, Davisware product softwares make it easy. Um, but if you can't get the data, you know, you're going to, you're going to be, it, it's, it's going to be almost impossible to do it. I mean, I know contractors that switch software companies because they can't get a hold of their own data. Um, mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to get data. You've got to be able to export data out of your system. If you can get data export out of your system, um, or you want us to try to help you get the data export out of your system, we haven't found a system we couldn't export, but like one, one software company, um, I don't want to say their name, um, but they make it virtually impossible. We have to export four different reports and then merge them all together to get the data all in one in one spreadsheet. So mm -hmm. it, getting a hold of the data, if you're going to do it yourself, is the number one step. Um, if you want uh, somebody to help you, like my company, uh, probably just picking up the 800 number and calling us, and, and somebody will get you on the phone with me, and I will work with you, you to get it to get it implemented. Okay, so the uh, actually uh, the follow up to that from the same person was, uh, no, I wear too many hats already. I'll just let you do it. So uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, he can go, he can call any of these numbers or emails here. He can go to the Roundtable Rewards page to to get you more information about the company. Um, so uh, Clint, if you do need help, just let me know. Um, and then uh, he, they asked. Um, can you give an idea what the average cost would be monthly for something like this? I know there's multiple levels to it and things like that. Uh, Kirk, what, what would you say to that question? Um, yeah, so all of, our, all of our campaigns, all the ones I showed you, is less than a dollar a household per month. Okay, so if you're talking about an install or, or intelligent or, or database program or even mailing to prospects, those are all like a dollar per household, right? So per month. So the, the thing that scares contractors, and it happens to me all the time, here I'm an honest guy, I say it's about a dollar or less a household, is they go, oh my God, I got 30,000 customers in my database. You know, I can't afford 30 grand a month. And the truth is, is once we get a hold of the data and we analyze it and we consolidate all the duplicates, and then we actually go through and find out who moved and who died and who got divorced and who lives in Florida now, once we get through cleaning all the data, and we do that for no cost, by the way. I mean, we do charge $500 to get started, but that's you know more just to set up the, the salespeople and techs in the system. Uh, but we clean up that data all up front, um, and what ends up happening is is we end up saying, hey, you can start here with you know a thousand bucks a month, and then we can grow together. Um, but the average, my average contractor is investing about 2,500 a month. So. Okay. All right. 
good. So it's not it's not it's not more expensive than hiring a person. I know that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, all right, it looks like uh, that's a wrap, Kirk. So thank you guys for joining us, and uh, we'll be back here next week at ten thirty. See y'all then. Thank you. <laughs>